So what has been the involvement of your Unison branch with the CEDAW campaign? And can you explain the CEDAW campaign from your perspective and your branch perspective? Absolutely. Um, we became involved in the CEDAW campaign uh, through a steward of her, our branch um, a few years ago now, um, who was a women's officer with the Kefili local government branch. Um, we got involved in that um, from there because we got involved in it from the back to 60 um, pensions uh, side of things. Um, and as I say, we basically got involved with a the campaign there. Um, what we did, we've been quite active in terms of supporting the CEDAW campaign um, because it is fundamentally around women's uh, rights and discrimination, uh, which is something, as I say, that the Unison, the trade union that um, I represent sort of thing as a branch secretary, is, is highly involved in. Um, you know, we, we go to many, many conferences each year. So we have women's conference, we have our local government conference and also our national delegate conference. And um, the, uh, the, the uh, issues of women's rights basically are, are, you know, always highlighted in those events. Um, and we hear from lots and lots of different motions about how discrimination against women affect them in everyday life. Um, and especially, as I say, in terms of employment as well. So um, we got actively involved in it through that sense in terms of women's rights. Excuse me. In terms of women's rights, I am, um, and uh, that's how we, we, we became involved in, in it for the with the branch. I am. Um, we recently attended the national delegate conference this year, and uh, a motion was put forward once again on um, CEDAW, um, and it was actively campaigning for the Unison Trade Union to get involved with a uh, campaigning and development of a women's bill of rights. Because we obviously recognise that um, the implication that CEDAW uh, being ratified um, into domestic, certainly being ratified and also incorporated into domestic law, would actually have um, on women's rights um, in the UK. Right. Um, good. And so, as the secretary of your branch, are you able to say what the members? view is of the importance of domesticating CEDAW, that is bringing it into law. Do you have some examples of what branch members might have said on this issue? Not any specific um, examples on CEDAW itself, but what we see certainly is um, working in local government. Traditionally, that is a, a female orientated sort of occupation, to be quite honest. You know, it is, it is heavily reliant on a, 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 a women's presence in the workforce. So what we actually see is, um, in, well, in Caerphilly, you know, there is a lot of home carers, there's a lot of cleaners, um, you know, teaching assistants. These are the roles that's predominantly occupied by women. And unfortunately, those roles, you know, however valuable that they are actually in society, and Lord knows where we would have been without them during the pandemic. But they are traditionally low paid roles. Um, and unfortunately, with low pay comes, as I say, you know, a, a, a lower kind of like contribution towards pensions. And I think, as I say, this is certainly something that our members, if we could actively campaign to get those traditional female roles recognised for their value within society then, as I say, you know, hopefully we could address the issue of low pay and then, you know, hopefully address the issue of low pay in retirement as well, given that it's based on your national insurance contributions. So while there is no specific examples, um, you know, or personal example, it is genuinely felt that within local government, there is, you know, a lot of work to be done to address that low pay situation. Um, and that is certainly something that we think that having CEDO um, incorporated into domestic law would, would actually help the majority of our trade union members with. Thank you. Now, just returning to your the motions that your branch has put forward, um, are you able to uh, reiterate 
um, the impact that the motions have had, where they've gone, that's number one. And then following from that, can you um, say whether you've actually approached members of parliament about their support for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women as a convention in itself, but also in terms of bringing it into domestic law. So motions and what's happened to them, but then the members of parliament and what your actions you've taken in that regard and what you know the MPs have done, if anything. Okay. I am um, to start off with the motions. I am um, originally, as I say, it was a few years now before the pandemic. I think it was 2018, no, 2019 actually. The first motion, as I say, was taken to Unison's women's conference. I am, um, and in that motion, um, we we sort of like heavily focused on more around the the pensions issue with women and low pay and low pensions. Um, and we mentioned, as I say, in that motion there around CEDO, um, and obviously the difference that that could could make um, to having it domesticated into into law. Um, we then followed that up with uh, a motion that went to um, the Wales TUC, and as I say, it was supported at Wales TUC. And again, that was around the need for CEDO to be. Uh, incorporated into domestic law and really the the need to have all trade unions on board so not just a uh, unison but actually the need to have all of our trade unions who have women members um, picking up that mantle and supporting CEDO. We then uh, moved that forward then um, and as I say we um, I believe as I say CEDO was also spoken about I am at the Labour conference. I am, and then as I say, more recently, like I say, it was this year now in um, June of 2022, we took it to our uh, national delegate conference. And again, that is where we was asking for support from the trade union to actually campaign for a women's bill of rights. I am, and obviously the implications that that would have I am, on women's rights in the uh, right across the UK. So that has been in terms of the motions that's been put forward from a unison perspective and, and my branch perspective. Uh, and then, as I say, um, I, certainly at one of those conferences, um, Angela Rayner gave her support for a CEDO um, when we spoke to her. Um, and I know that, as I say, there has been um, discussions uh, you know, around the halls of, of Westminster on CEDO. I am about actually pushing forward now for a women's bill of rights, especially now that Dominic Raab um, is looking at introducing the uh, a new reformed bill of rights in the UK. And as you'll be aware, uh, Your Honour, you know a lot of our women's rights have actually been taken from the EU, um, and it would it is quite concerning as what's going to happen with those rights if they are stripped out of a, of a UK bill of rights. And I think that's what makes it fundamentally more important now that we actually have a, a Women's Bill of Rights in the UK to make sure that those hard fought for rights aren't actually lost and we go, we go back 40 years. Good. I'm pleased to hear that uh, members of parliament are aware that the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination actually exists because we have found within the um, judiciary that there seems to be, at least on the part of some in the judiciary, um, a, a lack of awareness of CEDAW. So if MPs are coming to the party in terms of CEDAW and that it actually exists, that's at least one positive note. But I'd like to ask you also that, of course, we're here today in relation to the State Pension Act of uh, 1995 and 2011. And had a Women's Bill of Rights been domesticated, if we had this Women's Bill of Rights, are you able to say on your assessment whether this would have made any impact or had any power 
in relation to the deferral of the women's state pension age, the problem that we're grappling with now? I am, I, I'm afraid I can't give much on that because it's not my area of expertise. I am, all that I will say is that, you know, pensions um, are so hugely important, especially, as I say, to, to, to low paid women. Like I said previously, who are traditionally really occupied, um, you know, those roles within society, you know, caring, teaching assistants, cleaners, retail, and so on, having, you know, the, these women unfortunately experience poverty, um, not just in their working life, but then that actually goes on then. Um, and it leads to, as I say, poverty in retirement because of national insurance contributions paid, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, as I say, um, while I can't specifically answer about the, the, the pension, but what I can say is that, you know, pensions in your older age are, are fundamental to giving you a quality of life. Um, that unfortunately, you know, a lot of women struggle during their working life. So it's important, as I say, that we actually secure those pensions for them in later stages. So unfortunately, I, I can't add more to it than that. That's fine. Thanks so much, um, Ms. Dalymore. Um, because it leads on to the next issue that I'd like to, to address. And you've addressed it to some extent, absolutely. But just can you say from your experience as a trade unionist and working in the field you do and recognising the lack of a proper recognition in pay rights of women in those um, in the work to which you refer, how does gender, sex and gender, affect poverty? What impact does it have? Well, when you look at, like I've said already to, to, to some degree, when you look at those traditional roles within the society, those roles that are seen as the carers, the nurturers, uh, the educators, they traditionally as they fall to, to women. You know, when you look at, like I've said, when you look at cooks, cleaners, uh, teaching assistants, home carers, um, people working in residential care homes, um, they all are traditionally female roles. Um, and unfortunately, those roles, like we've seen during the pandemic, you know, we could not have survived without those roles. You know, our care staff working in residential care homes, they were the ones sitting with people when they were dying with COVID. Um, our teaching assistants, they were the people that was actually working in the education hubs so that children of our key workers could actually get to work and work in those hospitals, the nurses and the doctors that we actually so badly needed during that COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, the, the amount of hours of unpaid care that gets done by women, when you think that they are all, uh, most of the time they are working full time, they are caring for children, they're also maybe caring for elderly relatives as well. You know, those unpaid hours of uncare, uh, uh, you know, of, 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 of unpaid care that women to tend to do, you know, th that is how there is a huge difference in the workplace around those roles because, you know, females traditionally occupy those roles. And unfortunately, those roles, for some reason, whether or not it's because it's seen as women's work, um, are seen as of less financial value. Certainly in times of societal value, they are probably some of the most important roles that we have in our society today. But unfortunately, because they are, like I said, maybe seen as women's work, then they, they don't necessarily get that financial reward for it. So, you know, you, you've got women working potentially two or three jobs just to make ends meet. And unfortunately, you know, the way our pension system is, is set up, um, those two or three jobs can't be lumped together so that you can actually get a good pension, at least when you retire. Um, so so this, this is why we see a huge disparity in the workplace, really, with regards to women and men, is that, you know, women traditionally hold those lower 
societal value roles and 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 are in that trap of poverty through work and and unfortunately through into pension age and so can i just clarify then you've been very clear but that if there's a wage gap on based on gender grounds there's a gender gap then that gap in the pay rate impacts into the pension rate when the women retire that's my understanding absolutely yep. of course it mm. does i am and and especially as i say you know the the government i think short-sightedness really um when they look at things like national insurance the rate that you start to pay national insurance and um, they're constantly putting that up well okay that might be fine for people that are earning you know average wage or above average wage but unfortunately if you're working in a low paid job that you don't actually earn enough to to hit that national insurance threshold then that has a knock on effect in terms of the state pension the other age when you retire because of course you know what you get in a state pension depends on your national insurance contributions um, and if you are constantly in a, a a role that is low paid and you never hit that national insurance threshold then that has a knock on effect the other end when you come to retire thank you um just two final matters i'd like to canvas with you miss dalimore leanne um do you if we did have a women's bill of rights in the united kingdom how do you consider that that would impact on the world that women live in that is would a women's bill of rights impact practically on women's position in this country oh hugely absolutely huge and um, you know like i said at the beginning uh, of my testimony the motions that we hear going to conferences i am um, the majority of them are around women women's rights our impact on women disproportionately so you take things like um sexual harassment in the workplace a uh, violence against women a uh, disability um specific issues that black women face a uh, the, the whole range um of of areas of society that negatively impacts a, a, upon women a women's having a women's women's bill of rights could fundamentally change a lot of those areas you know even when you take a uh, violence against women and and the issue of refuge women refuge you know they they just now there is um you know so many women crying out for places in refuge due to dom domestic violence and unfortunately a lot of those times those places aren't available and they land up sofa surfing or staying with friends or relatives or or, or other friends and they get trapped stuck like, in that cycle whereas there would be a requirement to provide those services for women and that would be fundamentally what's different about having a women's bill of rights is that those services that those women so badly need would have to be provided whereas just now it's sort of almost provided piecemeal it's yeah well we'll put some money into the pot but it goes nowhere near to actually really um, addressing the the full need of of domestic violence and and the need for women's refuge and that's just one area you know it 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 would fundamentally change so much of women's lives um that you know they those areas that we've maybe been fighting for for years and years and years around discrimination could practically um if there was a will it could it could be eradicated thank you um is there any other issue or aspect that you'd like to raise this morning in your evidence to the cedaw people's tribunal on women's pension rights i am um, no nothing that i can think of your honor <laughs> well thanks so much um ms dalimore um uh, it's been a pleasure to have you and thank you very much for your evidence thank you Good. thank you